Hi, I'm Jim Mercurio. I originally did this theme class when I directed the other 40 DVDs in the uh, Expo series, but now that this is separate, I'm glad you figured out a way to uh, get the class. Samuel Goldwyn once said, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. And I get what he was saying. He was saying that people go to movies for stories, for emotion. They don't go for ideas. They don't go for preachy, you know, kind of <laughs> those kind of things. However, I know we as writers, one of the things that makes us sit down for maybe years at a time at a desk or, you know, you know, in front of a computer is because we have ideas about the world that we want to share, that we want, we want to communicate. So themes out there. However, I know one of the reasons we as writers spend years of our lives, you know, cranking out stories or working on a story is because we have ideas that we want to express about the world. So there are craft techniques that we can use, that we can learn to understand theme. Now, I actually feel this like this class is kind of an advanced class. Like if you've only written one or two screenplays, I'd say skip this class. Rewatch killer endings and come back to this, you know, a few, uh, you know, a few scripts from now. But if you've written some scripts, if you've already wrestled with some of these issues, and you know, you've already figured out your voice, or you're starting to find your voice, uh, and you know, dramatically, you've kind of mastered, you know, at least the kind of middle range elements of screenwriting, then maybe it's time to come here because I, I want to give you these tools. Uh, theme, theme has a way of like making a story universal. So there's definitely an emotional appeal to it in that. It makes it something that everybody can relate to. However, there's going to be a few like kind of left brain things in this DVD. We're going to have some charts. We're going to have literally like a Venn diagram. So I don't want you to get kind of like intimidated by that. It's just kind of a way for you to kind of understand it from, uh, you know, all angles so you can apply this to your work. But one thing before we get started, please never ever say, well, Jim said this was thematic, so I don't have to worry about the other stuff. No, you always want to make sure that your story is working on the other levels, emotionally, character wise, you know, tight script, good action description, everything else has to work. And then theme is like that extra layer. Don't ever justify or rationalize something just for its idea's sake. Okay? So if you're ready, here's the class. I'll let you know a little secret. We're not only going to be talking about left brain stuff and analysis. A lot of the stuff is, can be creative too. And I'm going to try to open up my thought process. I talk a mile a minute. Hopefully you actually kind of get into the way I think about the stuff and it actually help you start thinking about your work too. Because I don't have any super strong prescribed set of rules. I want to analyze this stuff. I want to look at it and maybe it'll help you do it, do it too. Because some of this stuff is rigorous. I mean, I'll show you a Venn diagram later on. I'll show you a mathematical diagram of something to, to, to make a point. But some of it will also be the opposite. I did not go back and rewatch these movies I talk about. I didn't study them and make sure everything was right. So a lot of times, if I'm explaining a scene to you, maybe it's wrong. Maybe it's a little bit off, or maybe I remembered it wrong. But that can be part of this creative process. You can say, well, Jim, subjectively, you remembered it differently, but that's how I created meaning. I thought it was this, I thought it was that, and then I got meaning from that. So that can be part of this creative process. If you go back and please prove me wrong or, or find counterexamples, th that's fine. But so part of this process is gonna be trying to kind of figure this stuff out. Now, you can approach the idea of theme or these tools from a left-brained idea where you're looking down at it. Okay, what's the point of that? Or what do these things have in common? Or, or what's the person trying to say? You can be above it, and that's kind of left brain logical side. Or you can come from underneath, which I think is more right-brained. You're in a scene, you're ready to shoot it. And uh, you have the camera right there. And you know in your head that um, one of the ideas in the movie is freedom or independence. And you have to set up your camera. And you have to figure out what the framing should be. Well, here's the thing. Everything, everything can contribute to meaning and to ideas. Rudolf Arnheim, uh, this, this uh, film theoretician, uh, I think a German film theoretician, wrote a book called Film is Art. And he said that basically you have reality and then you have an art. And every tool of any specific medium, I think he was talking about photography and film, is any time you make a choice creatively to make whatever you're filming or the subject of whatever you're doing different from what it really is, that's when it becomes art. You're making choices. And he thought kind of color was gonna ruin film because he thought, well, it's so much like reality, what's left for the, for the people to choose? And the thing is, you guys have a lot of choices. And maybe it's my coming at it from as a filmmaker, but, but I, I always am looking at it like, I, can, I wanna see how every single possible thing can contribute to an idea. It's kinda like form and content. Every single choice you make, uh, it can be, like I said, framing. You're trying to frame a shot. Maybe you're right inside it and you're trying to use your creativity. Well, it's about independence. Okay, it's about freedom. Okay, I have a frame. Can the people go outside the frame? Do characters, are they allowed to walk off the frame? Are they allowed to be half in, half out? If it's a Western and I have like the landscape, does the person come out of the wilderness or does he enter frame left or frame right? 
These are choices that you have to make as a filmmaker, down to the absolute smallest thing. Like, let's say you're gonna use a wide lens, a short lens. Now, for filmmakers, this might be hands-on. For you guys, it might be theoretical, but just bear with me for a second. Use a short lens, a wide lens, a fisheye lens. It exaggerates movement to and from. So somebody walking towards you would seem to be covering distance really fast. So all of a sudden, that choice of that lens creates some extra meaning. Wow, fast, power, efficiency. There's some ideas there. But how about this? You have, a, you have the focal length of your lens. You also have the focal distance, at what point you, you, you focus on. And then you also have the f-stop setting, which, accepts, which, which uh, affects depth of field, which is how much of what you're seeing is in focus. Now, by making a choice about whether or not, hey, maybe I'm the subject, am I in focus all the way? Or am I in focus and everything else is blurry? You are making choices about thematic ideas here. Is this about ambiguity or perception or isolation? Or am I, are you saying I'm a character who's disconnected from what's around me or doesn't have a clear picture of what's around me? For the absolute smallest choice down to focal length, focal, the point at which you focus in f-stop can, can be all part of content and form. So that's kind of where I want you guys to be thinking about theoretically about every tool that you have can be used in unison to create ideas and theme. So let's go from the very smallest thing to the biggest thing. Structure. Structure itself can be, can be a, a form of theme, thematic content. You know, form and content. There are movies like uh, Rashomon that are told in, in a style where a bunch of characters talk about an issue, an event that happened a certain way. And of course, they all have different ways of, of describing it. And it's because part of their ego, or it's because who knows what truth is. And that thematic idea of what the hell is truth is actually communicated in not just a character saying, you know, you never know what's true. That would be stupid. It's actually in the actual structure, in the content, the, the way the story is being told. It's like other movies, uh, The River, Renoir's The River. You know, life goes on and there's death and life and you continue to go on. That was a thematic part of that movie. That's the name of the movie too. And I'll talk about titles. I mean, if you know what your movie's about, make your title be right on. Uh, that can be part of it. Uh, Sleepless in Seattle. If you use that kind of cross-cutting structure where people aren't together yet, um, you're probably doing a movie about fate. You're probably doing a movie about destiny, you know? And in Memento, you know, telling a story, telling a story backwards and forcing you to, to comprehend, like thinking about memory and the way memory works, it's like, once again, that's part of the, the structure, the form the writer or filmmakers together chose is part of the content. To be honest, the real big thing you need to know about theme is uh, a definition. I think for the dramaturgist, for a writer, it's pretty much the climax of your movie. It's pretty much the ultimate dilemma. Theme is defined or created in the way the main character resolves the biggest ultimate dilemma in the movie. Class is over. Thank you for coming. Good, good night. Good morning. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's it. If you're a beginner, that's what you need to know. Just put your character in a good dilemma. Uh, I, I spent an hour and a half talking about this in Killer Endings, how to make sure that dilemma is specific. You know, go check it out. Um, Star Wars. I have the Force, which represents intuition, faith, God, human, whatever you want to put it, dilemma. And I have this computer technology, which is able to build the Death Star. I and mean, this is pretty good technology in the future there. And I choose the Force. Okay, what's the theme? I don't know, God is good, uh, humans are better than machines, uh, you have to trust yourself. Whatever it is, it comes out of that dilemma. No one talking about it, it comes out of the dilemma. LA Confidential, uh, I, wanna, I wanna capture and kill this guy who is very similar to the guy who killed my father, or maybe I kind of think of him as killing my father, and he's killed my friends. He's probably gonna endanger my life. He's a criminal who's killed many people. I wanna kill him. However, I have this really black and white, super ego, rigid way of looking at the world. And this is the way my dad did it, and, and, and I really think that's kind of how I want to be. So when he shoots him at the end, he chooses this side, and it's like the theme comes out of that. you got to be touched by evil to fight evil. Uh, if, if you really want to be able to fight evil and be powerful, you have to get your hands a little bit dirty. But the theme comes out of the action alone. Eight Mile. Uh, these guys are offering demos, they're offering me these contests, they're offering me all this stuff. Maybe my girlfriend can help me, maybe my mother will give me a bingo money, or... I have to go back to work and earn seven bucks an hour so I can go do it myself. Trust yourself. Or, you know, you, gotta, you can really only rely on yourself. That theme comes completely out of the dilemma. And that's where, you know, and that's, that's the starting point for all of this. Um, 
The dilemma has to be specific, and if you like this idea, to check out Killer Endings, but it's like a psychological projection, in a way, from the character. You have to kind of get inside the character's head and then make sure that the uh, ultimate dilemma that the person is, uh, is kind of is facing is the one that's really specific to him or her. And the thing is, though, if you're really specific about this, this concision allows you to, to basically know what your movie's about. It allows you to set it up. Because the beginning of LA Confidential is this great moment where uh, Dudley Smith, who's the bad guy, is facing Exley, and they're at the police station during a Christmas party, and he has two little, pieces, little cups of punch. He's sitting there, and, he, and, he, and, the, and the dialogue's great, too, because he's saying, would you rough somebody up? Would you plant evidence? Would you shoot somebody in the back? He's like, no, 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 no. But also, visually, he's testing him. He's saying, will you break the law at all? Will you break any rules? Are you, can you be tempted to, to go a little bit into your dark side to, at all? And he doesn't. And you see that's amazingly, that's brilliant. I mean, it, it, won, it won the Oscar for, for Best Adapted Screenplay because these filmmakers know what it's about. You know, sideways, they knew what it was about. Million Dollar Baby, which we'll talk about later. These filmmakers knew what it was about. Serpico. We know eventually he's a guy who's willing to stand up for, against the corruption and the society and, and, and the crooked police society. But at the very beginning, somewhere in there, because I, I didn't study this, I just remember the movie, um, he's out there eating, eating lunch with, his, uh, with the cops, and he uh, says, oh, give me that sandwich. He said, no, no, we, we get that, that other thing. And uh, he goes, no, I want the sandwich. Well, he gives it to us for free, so just, just take it. I don't care, I'll pay. And the cops are kind of like unnerved by the fact that he doesn't want to kind of play by the rules. Now, this is so awesome because it's basically an exact setup of exact kind of foreshadowing of what the movie's really about. But you can't even write that really specific scene, that awesome scene that's not wasting time, that's about something, unless you kind of know the ending. Does that make sense? So this kind of concision, this kind of left brain, at some point, I'm not saying you have this all the way in, but at some point you've got to figure out what that is so that you can have that kind of specificity at the, at the beginning. If you want to get more specific about how theme is created in that final dilemma, is uh, there's, there's some tools. Crisis, climax, resolution. Uh, the character's building up to a choice, the dilemma I'm talking about. The climax is the moment things change. He makes the choice, and the resolution is the aftermath. And basically, you have a chance to kind of play God here, because you're saying, um, if you choose this, this is what happens. So if you're a nice guy, and you turn into a killer to kill the bad guys, and you get the girl and save the day, you know, the theme idea is, you know, it's cool to kill somebody, or some, some people know who to kill, or, you know, sometimes you got to kill the bad guys, and that idea comes out. And, you know, like Dirty Harry, those kind of themes come out in those movies, but then Eastwood reverses it in, uh, in Unforgiven. I want to kill the guy who's a bad guy. I, kill, I choose to kill him, but the resolution is life still kind of sucks. I'm kind of back where I am. So, you know, that thematic idea of, you know, Killing doesn't really do anything. You can't solve anything by killing. You see how that thematic idea is pretty much like, it's like a gear shift. It's like, you know, you have the, the crisis, the choice, and the resolution where you play God there. Well, what happens when that person makes that, that choice? Ransom, I think Ransom was a movie that failed because you have a guy whose flaw is he buys his way out of everything. His son is at risk, and what's he do? He chooses to make it into a game where he can buy his way out of it. So that's, that's the climax. He chooses it, and he gets the kid back. The resolution is... Yeah, he saves a day. So thematically, what's this about? Mel Gibson better look good in the movie. To me, that makes no sense. The, the natural resolution is the guy made the choice that was completely his flaw. He should be outed. You know, his wife should look at him and say, you just made a game out of our son. I have to leave you. Or he should then be arrested because he outed himself as the kind of guy who will try to buy his way out of everything. That, to me, would have been really the kind of organic resolution to me. But you see, it's the choice, the climax when he makes it, and then the resolution, the aftermath, is where you play God. That's how you, that's how you communicate this stuff. Uh, Jeff Kitchen, we were talking about training day. Uh, Jeff has a class where he talks about dilemma for like an hour. And uh, he was saying, like training day, he'll take the resolution and he'll save a general idea. Like, you know, it's about a guy who, if you stand up for the right thing and say no, uh, even against tough circumstances and do the right thing, you can eventually you know, be rewarded. And, and that's one way to look at it, because I kind of said to him, I said, to me, the theme of training day is kind of what goes around comes around. Because the, uh, the Ethan Hawke character gets out of trouble because he, uh, he did a good deed at the beginning. And ultimately, ultimately the, uh, Denzel Washington is killed by the people because he screwed them over in a deal before. So to me, I get more specific. I say what goes around comes around. Now, I'm not saying there's right or wrong. If you can get so specific as to say what goes around comes around, that might help you with the subplot. That might help you tweak it. But, but if you want to just make a general statement, that's fine too. So definitely you know, use either way. There's no rules about this. It's just this is how 
Well, <laughs> no rules and break them at your peril. Uh, this is kind of how it works. This is how you create meaning in, uh, with, with drama. So let me tell you about a story. <laughs> one day, one day I was walking in the zoo and I was in a really bad relationship. I was seeing all those animals in their cages. I thought, they're trapped. All those poor animals, they have nowhere to go. There's just, there's just, there's no way out. Poor animals. And then a year or two later, maybe a year or two before, I'm making this all up as I go. Um, I was walking in the zoo and I saw the animals in their cages and I was kind of broke. My credit cards were maxed out if I had any. And uh, I was living paycheck to paycheck, got about $2 in the bank. And I said, God, those animals have it so nice. They got food, they have shelter. <laughs> They can socialize all day. I'm sure that the lions and tigers play cards at night. You know, I'm like, it's, it's a kind of cool life. And I realized that there's really no absolute meaning to any given event. Going to the zoo, animals there, it's a neutral thing. I bring some other element to it, and all of a sudden it creates meaning. And if those of you who've been to film school, Sergei Eisenstein, the great Soviet filmmaker, talked about montage that way. Because, you know, film, film is a bastard art. It steals from everywhere. Photography, painting, color, literature, drama. It steals all these things. And he said, well, pretty much what's really filmic, uniquely to film, is montage. You put two things together, and A plus B does not equal A plus B. It equals C. It, it actually creates something else. So if I said, hey, here's a picture of George Bush. OK, don't get that out of your mind. And then, hey, here's a picture of Osama bin Laden. Get, you know, get that. OK, there's George Bush, there's Osama bin Laden. But if I say, hey, George Bush, Osama bin Laden, all of a sudden, light bulb goes off, all these different ideas start coming out too. And you realize that actually you've kind of, you created, you created another idea by putting the two together. And actually, the idea is subplots, but more specifically any element you do this with, is you actually expand your meaning by putting two ideas together. So it's like nothing, nothing in and of itself is, is, is the point. The point is you put two things together and it expands out to create kind of a third meaning. But also another way to think about theme is that in a way it contracts. Like subplots for instance. Subplots is actually kind of what I'm talking about because subplots were a really big piece of the movie. So when you start putting those things together, subplots together, you actually will start helping to define theme because of the way they bounce off of each other. So here's, here's another way to think about it is the intersection of meaning. Here's a nice little diagram. Possible meaning, possible meaning. Okay, that's what it could be. Maybe these are all subplots, maybe these are elements, maybe these are image, images, maybe these are lines of dialogue. The theme is right here. It's the intersection of possible meanings. Everything that your movie could be about, it could be about that subplot. Ooh, it could be about this dialogue. Ooh, it could be about what this character's going through. It could be about this character going through. Well, they all have to intersect. There's something in common about all those things, right? And it's in that commonality I told you, Venn diagrams, huh? Pretty nice. Um, it's right here where your theme comes out. So in a way, every time you add an element together, you might expand out to another idea, but also you're limiting yourself too because you have to say, what do these two subplots and, and anything, what are these two choices we're putting together, what do they have in common? And that's, that's kind of that's what, uh, what it's all about. This whole idea of intersection of meaning and, and subplots colliding with each other, um, I got from watching a movie that I haven't seen. I haven't seen this movie. I saw two minutes of it on TV, and I saw, I saw the ending, and I saw the middle, and then I had this epiphany. I was watching, flipping through channels, trying to find some poker on TV, probably, and I, and I came upon, uh, is it The Great Waldo Pepper? Is that what it's called? The Amazing Waldo Pepper? The Great Waldo Pepper. I saw the ending. Uh, don't even know about it, but Robert Redford's, uh, I think he, he wanted to be an ace in the war, but he couldn't flying planes, so he's stuck flying in a circus flying show, and he's against the, the guy who was the really like, well-known ace, and they're flying at each other just for show, you know, just for like in a circus, and, they clip each, and he clips his wings, and they actually ruin the plane so that to the point where he flies off into the sky, but you know he's gonna die, you know he can't live, and I'm like, okay, next, I flip to the next channel, I was like, well, that's kind of weird, and what's that mean? Did he, did he wanna do war? Did he, was he suicidal? I don't know what it meant. So a couple of days later, I was avoiding writing, uh, and I turned the TV on for a minute, and I'm flipping through channels, and the Great Waldo Pepper was on again. And it was in the middle of the movie, and his friend, uh, Robert Redford's friend, crashed his plane. He was stuck underneath his plane, and uh, the plane was on fire. So the guy was going to die, he was going to get burnt up. So Robert Redford goes up and with a stick, smashes him in the head, and kills his friend. I said, oh. That's, well, first of all, it was a pretty, pretty good scene. I was like, oh, it's better to die than to live with some horrible pain. So maybe flying off at the end, maybe he's suffering. Maybe there's something that's suffering, and he actually chooses death 
over in, now here's the thing, I don't know if that's right. I don't, because I don't know the other four or five things that, that would actually would clarify that or help me clarify that. But you see how you put those two things together and all of a sudden an idea with more clarity and, and concision comes out of that. So that's what you got to think about um, with, with subplots. Um, in in uh, 8 Mile, see how subplots work. Uh, Kim Basinger's character comes home, and, and uh, it's actually shot really awesome. She, she's wearing this leather jacket, and her hair is beautiful, and she's backlit, and, and her, her jacket's all shiny, and, and, uh, and she's there. And then, and then, specifically, she's making breakfast for her son, because this is about, like, in, you remember I said it was about independence. Do you trust yourself? You trust others. She's making breakfast for him. She's taking care of him. You're like, yeah, he's going to get her to take care of him, just like you always, he, you, he always wanted. And she has this big wad of cash out, and you thought, oh, maybe she had her character arc, and she has a great job now. But no, she won, she won a bingo, and she's not going to give that money to him. And you realize, oh, okay, well, this is, once again, this is that idea of, can he rely on her? No, he can't. But let's say you're on the set, and you're the director, and Kim Basinger comes to you, and she didn't do this, but let's say she did and said, hey, I don't really like my character. I mean, if, if I was a mother and I won some bingo money, I'd, I'd give it to my son for his demo. And, but now, as a director, you have to say, or the writer, you have to say, but the movie's about a guy who has to, who has to trust, him, trust himself, so we need this to go that way, you know, we, we, we can't possibly do that. So it's like you see specifically how a subplot is going to help you uh, support and kind of uh, reinforce the ideas that are going on. If someone says, well, hey, we'll just change that subplot because, well, that might make no sense. If she gives him that $2,000, the movie's over. He goes and makes a record. He goes and makes a demo by himself. He does it. You, that can't happen, but you see how the, the, the specificness, it wasn't just a matter of, oh, she's back together, she's good, she's got money, isn't that so nice, he'll be inspired by her. No, no, no. Specifically, can he rely on her? Can, is she going to give him that money? Is she going to start taking care of him and cooking? Maybe the cooking was something that came up on the spot. It's got to be specific, and, and, and it's chicken egg. Which one comes first as far as did you, the scene help to find the theme or vice versa? But that's, that's, that's how it works. Um, another thing is the movie uh, 13. Did you guys see that movie? Nice movie. I think it should have been called Twelve Steps. Um, <laughs> there was there was a kind of a kind of whole AA kind of mentality about taking things one day at a time, and and you can't force things. And was, those ideas were in there. And at the end of the movie, there's a really nice moment when uh, the last shot or s last moment of the movie is the daughter and the mother in bed together. There's a series of match dissolves from the exact same position like going through the night, and, and they, they switch positions a little bit. And in the morning, the light's a little bit different. The light's coming in, and the girl wakes up, and she, she sits up. And, you know, in that moment, there's actually a lot of meaning. There's, I mean, the idea that a dissolve is something that shows passage of time, yet you're not going anywhere. So this idea of time, and, 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 and then she wakes up, hey, it's one day at a time. So there's actually a lot of this idea. You got to take one thing at a time. It's a new day. Those ideas are right there in that thing itself. Right? It's, I think there was a good job of actually putting a lot of content within the actual scene. Like, you know, the fact that it was lap dissolves or match dissolves, the fact that it was like the morning, and the fact that they decided to do it really, that was a nice touch. However, to make sure that this idea of, hey, you gotta take one day at a time is really the way what you're saying in this movie, you have to go back and you have to put the opposite in there. You notice there's one scene with her father, and her father comes by and says, hey, so what's the problem? Let's fix it. You realize, that, that, whether you want to articulate it or not, that's the antithesis to that idea of you got to take one thing at a time. You can't just fix it. You can't just come in and solve it and, 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 and be very guy-like and, you know, snap your fingers and it'd be over, right? So the fact that that character exists in that world helps kind of uh, sh shine light on, on the fact that maybe this movie's about the opposite. Maybe the movie's about, you know, you got to take things one a day at a time. That's all you can do. And that's, you know, I, I've never been in AA only because they don't have it for Hagen dazs uh, But, um, <laughs> kidding, kidding, I'm, I'm svelte. Um, but, but the idea is, <laughs> the, the idea is that um, that idea, which I believe is what they were doing, and, and if, if you disagree with me, fine. Go back and tell me what that father's response had to do with the rest of the movie and what that ending had to do. If you can figure out a different meaning, awesome. But that's how you create meaning. You start echoing and bouncing and rhyming things off of each other. Um, all this stuff is a fancy way of explaining concepts like a foil character. A foil character is a character, usually in a subplot, who has a situation similar to the main characters, and he or she does something differently. And it kind of illuminates or throws into relief the main person's uh, situation. Now, uh, one of the speakers here was talking about sideways, and he said, well, the Miles character chooses to go and get the girl at the end. He makes a good choice. He grows. He has his character arc. And so does Jack. Jack does the mature thing and goes back to the woman and gets married. And 
he's thinking along the right lines because you're going to find meaning in those. But I personally found it differently. I thought when the Jack character was in the bar saying to him, dude, we could open a winery. I love this girl. She, I love her kid. We could, just, we could just come out here and hang out. I actually believe... I actually believe that was sincere. I actually believe that was probably what he was meant to do. So when he actually goes back to his wife at the end, it's actually a regression. It's actually a moving backwards. Hey, moving backwards and moving about sideways. Okay, but the idea is he, he failed in a way because there was nothing appealing about that life and about the way he treated her that I would say, oh, that's growth for him to go back there. So I say he actually failed. He actually took a step backwards. He had a chance to go forward. He went backwards. So at the end, when the Miles character goes and knocks on her door, you can understand in the context, that's awesome. He's, he's, he's making a better choice than that. And, and that meaning and that power is partially comes from uh, the fact that you have a character who's got a similar dilemma, or maybe the exact same dilemma, couched in different terms, and he or she makes a different choice, and it sheds light onto the main character's dilemma. Does that make sense? The chicken with a thousand faces. Joseph Campbell, in his uh, great interview with uh, Bill Moyers, talking about hero with a thousand faces, Campbell says to Moyers, he says, in these stories, the world of the story has a way of coming up and challenging and hitting the, the hero in a way that he or she is ready for, it's something appropriate. And the reason why it's chicken with a thousand faces is because this is basically the old chicken egg argument, what's, what's, what came first, it's character or structure, structure, character, it's mood. Because ultimately they're the same thing because the character has to have the things that face him that define the character. The character is only defined by facing the events that, com that, come, that come that way and kind of kind of vice versa. So, of course, if I think character and structure are the same thing, I want to start talking about how character orchestration, how the interrelationship between characters uh, actually uh, help create meaning in ideas. And if, if you have ideas, you don't have characters spouting out philosophy. You put those ideas into characters. And, and, and they, through drama, they have, they have conflict there. Now, what, thinking about character orchestration, what it can do is it can help clarify stuff. Uh, it creates conflict. It also helps you specify stuff. If you're sitting there, you're writing The Godfather, and you're stuck on Michael. Well, Michael, Michael's about, well, Michael, he likes his family too much. Uh, he loves his family, even over killing people. He's a businessman. You don't quite, how do I sum up Michael in a second? But, well, I'll tell you what. How about Sonny? I, this is one of my classes. What about Sonny? First word that comes to your mind, they said, hothead. Okay, Sonny, hot. Michael, cold. Oh, chill. You get it. Oh, hot, cold. Okay, I get it. Here's a guy who's so cold, he'll kill his family for business. He'll close out. Remember the end? He'll close the door. He'll close the door on his wife. Read more into it, all things feminine, connection, human, all that stuff. He's so cold, he'll, he'll be able to kill his own family to protect this thing he has. So, of course, at the end of Godfather 3, what's he left with? He's alone in a chair, dying by himself. Hot, cold. And it's like, I, I'm not saying those are the rules, you better write that down, you better use it that way. I'm saying it might help you. You might be able to think about really clear, concise ways to talk about your characters. Um, in LA Confidential, the three characters, in a way, are kind of the, the ego, the superego. You know, Russell Crowe is all impulsive. I want what I want, I gotta get it, I'm not gonna stop. And you have a character who's all black and white, we gotta do the right thing, we better. We better. And you have a guy who's all selfish and kinda like, I'm not saying he's liter they're liter literally this. You know, uh, Brian Helgeland and uh, Curtis Hansen may have never thought this, but if for us to look at it and say, hey, wait a second. Well, I would say probably that's a pretty good model for conflict, right? The id ego, super ego, I'd say it's, there's been a few things written about that stuff, maybe. Um, it kind of makes sense. But then you also say, well, okay, I have the, the ego, super ego. What other character might I need in there? And, and, and if a character comes in that's redundant, you might say, well, wait a second, I already have the character who's impulsive or a character who's, who's moral. Well, I have the super ego character in there. And you see how you can kind of define the different characters. And the bad guy, really, is somebody who's all three of those things. He's the full character. He is id, ego, super ego, and that's why he's more powerful. And if these, the three of them would get together and talk at the beginning of the movie, the movie would be over. So what happens to happen is the story actually makes uh, 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 actually into all three characters. He has to grow into being all those things. But you just see it's just a way to kind of help you, uh, you know, get it, uh, at, at conflict and stuff like that. Another film I want to talk about is A Million Dollar Baby. And now here's the thing. A Million Dollar Baby, it's not her story. It's his story. Let's look at the dilemma. I've heard boxers that I love in the past I've hurt my daughter in the past, and I'm having a really hard time dealing with that, right? So I meet a woman who is a woman my daughter's age and who happens to be a boxer, right? 
He doesn't say, he doesn't say generic advice about you better exercise or eat your Wheaties. He says, protect yourself, right? That's what he wants to do. Okay. Then, in the third act, to protect her, he has to kill her. You get it, right? Okay. These filmmakers know what this movie's about. Because before he makes the final decision uh, to kill her, and, and the reason why this isn't a movie about euthanasia or, or, or you know, life or death rights, it's not about that. Because he goes to the priest character, and he says, should I do this? And the priest does not have some generic answer. You know, euthanasia is frowned upon by the Catholic Church. You're going to hell. I can't morally, I can't morally tell you to do that. No, that's not what it's about. The character says, I know who you are. I know what guilt you carry for hurting people in the past. If you do this, you will obliterate your soul. Maybe he doesn't use that language. You will never recover. Do you see how specific that is? Do you see how that character, the priest, helps define the main character? Because, yeah, I analyze movies, so I got that about him. But if, if, if you need help figuring out who your character is, you have to figure out who's that character who calls him on his stuff near the end. Which character knows him well enough? And, and once again, chicken egg. Okay, you know your main character? Yeah, we like to think that all, all the characters we create are just our own unique individual creations that have a life of their own. No, not really. They actually pretty much exist to come into conflict and to illuminate and to, and, to, you know, and, and to create meaning with that main character. And that's not a bad thing. That's actually a good thing because it allows you for, for unity. So let's say... He had a best friend character who kept meeting at a bar, and at the end, he was the one who said, uh, yeah, I know you, because the writer knows the theme, I know that the way you deal with guilt is you're going you're, you're gonna to lose your soul if you go do that to her. And you say, well, yeah, but he's a guy in a bar. Well, hmm, who would know about guilt? Who would actually have the experience to be able to say, I know about guilt, I know how guilt destroys. Oh, he needs to be a priest. Oh, okay, let's go back and I'll make him a priest. Oh, and also because the daughter, oh, he's talking to the priest about the daughter because he feels guilty. You see that, speci that specificity, being that specific, that concise to know what your movie's about, that's where you can create great characters. A great character helps define that main character and it also helps the dilemma, the climate, all that stuff. And this all comes out of understanding the interrelationship between the characters. If you see what the uh, friend character, the mentor, the ally, the reflection, whatever you want to call it, the priest character can do in, uh, in a movie like Million Dollar Baby, think about what the antagonist can do. The antagonist actually has to, uh, I use this little sentence from Michael Haig, has to embody the inner conflict of the protagonist. The antagonist has to create, has to be built in such a way that he specifically, or he or she specifically pushes the buttons and challenges uh, the protagonist in a really, really specific way that's specific to the growth of the character and, and what's really the flaw of that main character. Like in the Confidential, he says, you won't, you won't plant evidence, you won't shoot someone in the back, you won't rough someone up, you can't touch me. I'm so much better because I played dirty, dirty than you. And, there's, and basically, the, sub, you know, the subtext as a writer, you're thinking, he's, he's challenging him to grow. There's no possible way he's going to be able to, to overcome him unless he faces that specific stuff, not in general, I better become a tough guy. No, no, no. I better get over that black and white superego way of looking at the world. And you see, it's not the goal, it's not the physical goal of the, of, of the antagonist, but in a way it's the function. That he or she has to provide the, 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 the fight that makes that character face who she, he or she really is. Because in, 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 in a sense, you're creating like a rhetorical argument. I think about Wall Street the way the Charlie Sheen character represents something, but, but the argument that, that's incorporated into Gordon Gecko is really strong and powerful. Greed is good, and maybe that is. And it's, like, and it's like, in a way, the protagonist is representing a thesis, and the antagonist comes on and says, no, no, antithesis. It's actually this way, and at the end of the movie, there's a th synthesis. So in, in, like in LA Confidential, I think the protagonist might be thinking, I can live black and white. I can live by only making really safe, good choices, always making the right choice. I can live that way. And then against that argument comes, no, you're weak. I will be able to destroy you because I can play dirty. I know my dark side. I can use all of myself, not my goody two-shoes, you know, not just goody two-shoes, not just those skills. I can do anything to defeat you. And by the end, it's, it's, it's thesis, antithesis, synthesis is that I can play it dirty too, and I can break those rules, but I can also do good and use it for something, you know, it doesn't just have to be evil and in power, that kind of thing. So you see that literally you're creating a rhetorical argument 
in the way that you construct your characters. Not in your speech. Do not have a climax in your film where a character says that stuff aloud. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't and we'll talk about dialogue in a second, but, but do not, please don't, please don't do that in dialogue. It, it happens in character, it happens in structure. I'm thinking about a movie and a possible meaning of, okay, here's an event in this movie. Uh, I'm gonna choose my duty and doing the right thing over this potential love. I'm not gonna hire Jews where, at my, to work in my house because of, of the Nazis. I'm gonna choose uh, to worry about my feet that are really killing me instead of, uh, instead of talking about Nazis with you. And the other thing that happens in this movie is, is someone says, it doesn't matter if you're well-intentioned, it doesn't matter if you have passion or feelings, uh, if you're not a professional politician, we're gonna be doomed. Now, that happens to be the movie Remains of the Day. So this idea of passion versus principle is the way I would boil it down to explain it. And you see how all those different characters, this was, this was uh, the, the Anthony Hopkins character, uh, this was uh, his, his boss, uh, Darlington, I think it is. He was just, just a wet noodle, no passion, no principle. This character thought he had principle, but didn't have any passion. You see down here the French guy, another paradigm, another rep permutation, another repetition of this idea of another kind of passion. My foot hurts. I can't talk about Nazis because my feet hurt. And you see that, like, you know, the same idea kind of keeps showing up, showing up, showing up till you get down to, well, the thing that that has in common, the intersection of all those ideas is this question of passion versus principle, emotion versus kind of doing the right thing. Now, you can use different words if you want, but, but I think that's a great adaptation. I think it's a great movie. It's, 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 it's a great novel. Um, you have to think about how all those things come together to create that meaning. So it's like you can use character orchestration to take an idea, a theme, and mix it up. Like one character might, kind of like the id ego, super ego, and the confidential. Each character will represent a different permutation of the ideas that your movie's about. And finally, if you want to write something that resonates all the way down, you have to ask, ask some hard questions. And you can look at Sophie's Choice and say, yeah, you know, you know uh, she has to give up her child to the Nazis. Obviously, the biggest dilemma anyone will ever have to do. And, uh, you know, Nazis are bad, right? We all agree. You know, they're Nazis. And maybe, I'm sure somewhere in that movie, I haven't seen it in 15 years, uh, you know, people were probably Nazi-like, metaphorically. And probably somewhere in the movie, people were the opposite of Nazis. There's somebody who will give her freedom and, and let her do things. And uh, obviously, she's not a Nazi. I mean, her, her kids were taken away. But if you really want to explore an idea, you gotta, you got to have it there all the way. She chooses... In the book, I think maybe this is more in the book, she chooses to give her daughter away because she knows her son has a better chance of surviving. Ooh, she's a Nazi. She decides who gets to live based on he can survive, he's stronger, it makes more sense. I got chills. But, but you know, she, yeah, she was the victim, but she's a Nazi. I'm just, you know, I'm just saying this as a, you know, as rhetoric, just as a way to talk about it, but. If you really want to explore an idea, um, you can't just go, well, good guys, bad guys. You got to really go down and ask yourself the question. Uh, if you like this idea, you know, McKee's book, he talks about negation of the negation. He talks about, you know, the forces of antagonism. It's not just antagonism, it's like even just characters. You want to not just go from love to hate to indifference, you have to go deeper. Self-hate, uh, hate that's disguised as love, that kind of thing. If you really want to do a masterpiece, if you really want to ask hard questions and explore something, you have to dig down, you have to get to the underneath, and it's like in Sophie's Choice, in a way, she's a Nazi. She makes the same choice the Nazis do. I decide who lives or who should live. And, uh, you know, it's, it's unnerving in a way, but if you want to really explore something to that depth, you have to get it all the way down to uh, kind of th that level. To blah or not to blah? Dialogue. Now, okay, I told you, please do not in the, in the end of your movie, have a character say, why can't we all get along? We're the same, you and me. No, you do, you do that in dilemma, you do that in action, you do that in the drama of the story, you do that in the subplots. You, you might have those ideas, but, but no, please do not have characters just saying that. Now, so the first thing is, is just like dramatic dialogue can't be on the nose, you can't say the dramatic subtext, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't want, uh, I don't want Rick at the end of Castlebanco to say, you know, I realized I still love you even though we didn't have that. You want him to say, we'll always have Paris, or here's looking at you, kid, and we get I love you, because that's a dramatic subtext. But there's also thematic subtext. We also don't want Ilsa to say at the end of Casablanca, I think it's so awesome the way you've learned to love country and me and yourself again. 
it's just, it's just beautiful. No, we don't want on-the-nose thematic dialogue either. So that's, that's the very first thing I want to say. Now there, but there are some things you can do with dialogue. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, a theme line. Somewhere in the beginning or middle, not, please not the end, you can, say, you can throw a line out like in uh, American Beauty. Never underestimate the power of denial. Oh, yeah, set it there so later on it resonates. Because I don't, I don't want it in the theme. I don't want it in the climax of the movie because it's just going to bog it down with, with it's going to be that message we're talking about. But if your ideas are communicated in drama and in characters and in the fight and the dilemma that they're in, you can set it up with the theme line. And uh, another way to, to get thematic ideas out in dialogue is a tagline. Uh, tagline is a, is a line that sometimes comes, it's repeated several times throughout a movie. Or, or maybe it's a really important line that kind of calls attention to itself. And the, the tagline ideally actually changes meaning. Like in The Edge, the character says, um, never feel sorry for a man with a plane. And it, at the first time he says it, it means, uh, you know, never feel sorry for a guy who's really wealthy. And then he says it later, never feel sorry uh, uh, for a man with a plane. And I think then it's like, you know what, you should feel sorry for a guy who's that rich. And then he says it again, never feel sorry for a man with a plane. And I'm making this up, and this is my interpretation. Never feel sorry for a man who actually has some spiritual flight who is kind of up there, and, and I might be wrong on my interpretations, but it definitely is repeated, definitely it, it, it has cumulative power in this repetition, and my, my interpretation might be wrong, but, but you can figure out a line that, that kind of goes through and repeats in your script and gives extra, extra meaning to that. I was talking about how a theme line can set up the ending of your movie. I want to talk about one of my favorite setups, uh, called the alley-oop. It's, you know, like in basketball, you throw the ball out for someone to slam dunk. Oh, I want you to slam dunk your script in the climax. I want you to do it without talky dialogue, without being preachy or on the nose thematically. Uh, and one thing you can do is use an alley-oop. Use words or dialogue in the beginning of your movie that will actually resonate later on with the actual action. I can think of a bunch of examples. I think of Godfather, when Michael and uh, Don Corleone are talking in, in the garden. He says, after I die, if anybody comes to you and makes a deal, they're the traitor. So later on, when Michael kills everybody in the, at the end of the movie in that great montage, uh, it's him being cold, it's him being ruthless, but also it's like a gift from his father. We suddenly understand in terms, oh, it's a legacy. The father gave him that information. So it slightly taints how we, we view that. There's another scene in Crimson Tide that uh, Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman uh, are talking in the war room about war. And Denzel Washington says, you know, enemy itself is war. War is the enemy itself. And then later on, he doesn't need to say that stuff. Because when they have guns and Mexican standoffs and people pointing guns at each other, I don't want them to start talking philosophy. Get it out then in a nice... And that scene, the scene does not stop the movie. It's conflict. It's them fighting at each other. There's like race stuff going on. There's like competition. All these awesome things going on. But, but those words allow you to understand what's happening later. Good Will Hunting. He says that the best friend character, uh, Matt Damon, or Ben Affleck says to Matt Damon, he says, if I ever showed up knocking on your door and you weren't here, it'd be an awesome day. So at the end of the movie when he's gone to get the girl, he, Ben Affleck comes up and knocks on the door. And you might say, God, Ben Affleck's such a great actor because he was like happy but sad. No, 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 that wasn't Ben Affleck. He just walked off the porch. All that idea, all that, oh, it's a good thing, but it's a bad thing. All those, it, it, it's, it's good that his friends left. All those ideas come from the setup earlier. So think about Ali Oop. You can put dialogue earlier on that will set up, you know, kind of what the climax means in action only. I believe great movies have thematic power. I believe they're concise, they're about something, you know what it's about, that idea is echoed throughout. Um, however, you can apply these principles to your dialogue, but it's at the end. It's after dramatically the dialogue is sound, that it's good dialogue, it makes sense for the characters, it's tight, it's not redundant, you've gotten to the point. So it's like after you write really great dramatic dialogue, right? Then you can start doing this. It's like anything in your script. Because the reason why I don't say for beginners to do this, I do not want to hear, well, my script is pretty much run-of-the-mill romantic comedy, but it's got really good themes. No, because oh, you might say that about Sleepless in Seattle, but Sleepless in Seattle also had this kind of like, at the time, feeling revolutionary structure of like, they're, they're not going to be, they're going to like not meet until the end. It's, it can't be just, oh, it has good themes. Or this line is really thematic, that's why it's there. No. That, that scene, it's thematic, that's why it's there. No, it has to be working on the dramatic level. Every other class that you'll take or every other DVD in the series you'll buy, it's got to be all those things first. If, if it's that, then you can go back and you can tweak and hone stuff for thematic touches. Uh, one of my favorite unproduced scripts is uh, 
project called A Mile Past Eternity. And it's, it's a great magical realist story. And in the story, uh, it's about faith and faith and hoping things will work out, you know, really nice. And uh, this woman, Sicily, she's in Africa, and she's having to live with the circus. And there's this young black boy whose name is Africa with a K. So talk about thematic content. I mean, even the names of these characters. And the character who's keeping them apart, the, the foreman, his name is Cursed, K-U-R-S-T. And once again, two out of these three characters have names that in some way actually are about what they are. Because, you know, in a way, if this is about faith, magic, hope, his name is Cursed. You know, this, this is a writer, whether she got there intuitively or with logic, I don't care, but she got there. So she, she, she's talking, the young girl's talking to the young black boy, and he comes up and draws a, a line in the sand. And I don't even remember what the line is, because I've talked to Nida, the writer, and I've said, you know, this is the line, don't cross the line. Well, okay, so that might be cool. Here's the line, don't cross the line. The action is actually probably more important than the dialogue, but that's a nice little moment. He says something, but let's talk about what he says. You know the beat is... You two are supposed to be apart. But now, depending, what's this movie about? Is it about the way uh, they do things in that culture? Uh, cross the line. We don't do that here. Okay, that's one way. Is this a movie about fate? <sighs> line. It's not in the stars. You two. Or maybe makes the line. Uh, don't tempt fate. Maybe he crosses the line and says, we see things black and white here. You know, is the movie about morality? Is it about fate? Is it about the, the society? You, you know what I'm saying? You can, you can layer or texture or point to the ideas in the movie with the exact line choice. Does that make sense? I mean, do, the, do you understand how those lines resonate slightly differently? If you want to write a masterpiece, it gets down to that level where each line will be tainted with exactly the ideas. Now, I'm not saying you should say, don't you understand that societal conventions are in this community that black and white people can't talk to each other and I'm the master here? No, you don't say that. This, it's all in the subtext, it's a dramatic line, but you can tweak that line to kinda be what you want it to be. But please don't ever give me a line of dialogue that's only thematic. It's gotta be that and then you can go on and, and do that too. Image systems, uh, motifs, recurring ideas. Uh, I'm not a master in semiotics, but I think there's roughly like external and internal, or they may call it filmic and extra filmic. There are things outside the movie that don't have the meaning. Like in Godfather, every time orange comes up, oranges or orange light, someone dies. I, I forget who pointed this out to me, but you go through and you see oranges and you get shot and you see orange light. And, and the idea of oranges, this subconsciously you're creating this pattern that um, we start associating with ideas. That's one thing, I'm not gonna go too much into that, but Internal or, or image systems that actually have mean kind of what they mean, I think can be very powerful. And the external ones can be too, but like my favorite example of an image system is in uh, Silence of the Lambs. The, the recurring motif, this idea that comes through, the idea of sight. The way Buffalo Bill literally hunts with like uh, night vision goggles. It's literally hunting women. Uh, the way Buffalo... Uh, Hannibal Lecter talks to her and says, remember all those guys with their eyes all over you. The way the Scott Glenn character looks at her and lies to her, the way all the sheriffs and his deputies all just stare at her and all she has to do is stare back to kind of to kind of be strong. And um, th this idea that if you, if you know anything about you know, film theory, the, you know, the whole feminist film theory is based on this idea of gaze, that inherently in film, you know, women are the ones who objectified. There's pleasure in seeing, uh, and you know, so that this idea of seeing is something that comes up a lot, and especially you know, De Palma, Hitchcock, uh, movies about voyeurism, and in this movie, so it's a really powerful thing because he literally he's hunting women with night goggles. So this this is not something I'm just kind of stretching to make up. It's all there. So it's and the only person in the whole movie, other than Hannibal Lecter, who's a male, who gives it to her straight, is the grad student. He asks her to go get a cheeseburger with him. And she says, are you hitting on me? And he says, yes. You know what's kind of peculiar about that guy? He has lazy eye. He has business. The only guy who looks at her eye and gives it to her straight is the guy with the crooked eye. And you see, hey, these filmmakers know, no, don't, for God's sake, don't stop a movie and have some, some like, you know, scene with the guy with the crooked eye just because it's so thematic. No, 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 it's all just there anyways. And then there's little extra touches. So you see how all this stuff builds up. At the end of the movie, hmm, what happens? How do we understand the meaning of this movie? Well, the lights are completely out, 
In some ways, I've said, whether it's in the movie or out of the movie, that, that, the, that the gay is looking is kind of a male, masculine, predatory hunter thing. She's in a dark room. She can't see anything, and she's being tracked by a guy with night goggles, so I'm not pulling this out of my butt. And uh, ultimately, the way she saves the day is she hears him and is able to shoot him before she's able to shoot her. And you see that this idea that, you know, th there are other senses. Maybe this masculine way of doing things is not the only way. No? I don't know, maybe bringing masculine and feminine into a movie where Jodie Foster hunts down a male serial killers who wants to kill women to turn into them. Hey, maybe I'm just making this up and it has no content in the movie, but I, I kind of beg to differ. It's, it's a fantastic movie. And so the power of this ending is actually amplified and kind of magnified and set up by the, all these kind of recurring ideas that, that follow through. And uh, I'm not saying, you know, a lot of this stuff is directorial touches, but as a screenwriter, without bogging down your read, you can put some of the stuff in there. And it'll mostly happen at a kind of an unconscious level for the reader. But at least if you know what the film's about, if you want to put some touches in there, th that's fine because you can actually build power in on some unconscious level or to a really savvy reader, they'll start picking up on this and it'll, it'll, it'll start making sense. Another movie that I think is really powerful, probably one of the most thematically coherent movies that uh, I've actually given a class on is, uh, is Midnight Cowboy. Like from, from the title itself, you know, Midnight, Night Time, Dark, dark cowboy, midnight cowboy. I mean, from the song to every shot to the, the, the lens filters, every single thing in that movie is contributing to some of these ideas. And I'll, actually, I'll talk about some of the opening images of that movie later on when I talk about forcing you guys to, to use these same kind of ideas when working on your scripts. So, as promised, left brain logic. Let's talk about the logic of theme. Let's, let's talk about kind of how we use logic to create theme. Now, the very simple way to think about it is X leads to Y. Macbeth could be ruthless ambition leads to ruin, you know, the nature of a tragedy. The flaw leads to the demise. Um, in uh, Hedda Gabler, or actually no, Doll's House, moral inequality in marriage leads to destruction of the marriage. X leads to Y. That's one way to think about it. Start there. But there's another way that's a little bit more... Um, Specific person goal determinant. A person gets something because of blank. And that determinant is really important. In a romantic comedy, uh, maybe it's Pretty Woman. Uh, Richard Gere gets the love, gets the girl because he's able to overcome his fear. He's afraid. He's unafraid to love again. He's able to risk. So if you that determinant is really kind of key because that's really what it's all about. Because actually, your determinant if A gets B because of C, C, nice letter for C is uh, C, is goes right to your climax. That's your obligatory scene. Your obligatory scene, your climax, that ultimate dilemma, is gonna be resolved by that determinant. So it's like character arc, theme, endings, they all kind of, this all comes together in, in, in that final moment. So person goal determinant, and if you wanna get even more kind of specific about this, let's look at um, a Danish writer named Ingolf Gabold has this chart about trying to really spell out how theme works. Ingolf Gabold's method. The determinants, the thing that helps the thing happen. Uh, it, it helps the objective happen and it happens to a person. Uh, the dramatic subject is the character. He or she is trying to get the dramatic aim. It's the determinant along this axis that brings it to the person. The advantage over Ingolf Gabold's method and this kind of specificity is that it's better than X leads to Y because it talks about the determinant, the thing that really leads to the resolution. Um, so let's apply this to Dirty Harry. Uh, the most violent guy is able to bring justice to the city or the community, the people there. So on this line, it's what allows him to do that. On the up and down line, you have Harry is going after justice. He has, he has things that help him. He is violent in this world. That's an that's a, that's a ally. He's a nonconformist. He's determined. He has things that are conflict against that. The law, well, sometimes what he does is kind of illegal. Uh, a rule-abiding rule boss, I assume, in a timid society. Like I said, I haven't studied this movie, but I, th I think how I remember it, this is kind of the idea. So on one way, if you look just the very top, most violent justice city, okay, he, he saves the day, he gets justice because he's the most violent, okay? Might makes right. Okay, that's one way to think about theme. It might be that specific. Or that, or that, you know, quick. But if you want to think about it even a little bit harder and think about, well, these are the good things, these are the bad things. Okay, in, in a timid, overly cautious society, real justice can be achieved by people who are willing to take decisive, albeit morally ambiguous actions and or violence. I mean, you see how literally you can create, you can state really explicitly what your theme is. And in and, and doing that, you can ask yourself, what are the forces 
that helped him get that? What are the forces that are against that? Because those together are going to create your idea. And once again, no dialogue, no over-explaining, but you can see how this can help you. And this is totally over the top, like analytical. You probably don't do this until afterwards. You probably don't do this unless you're a director or director of development. But at some point, if it helps you to look at it this way, hey, try it. So Dirty Harry, that's one way. That's one film. Let's look at Chinatown. Once again, this is subjective. You could, you could disagree with, with the, the, the fill in the blanks I use, but just run with it and, and please go, go home and disprove me and, and that'll be part of a learning experience. So he wants to help. The ability to help her, the desire to help her could bring justice, protection, love to uh, Evelyn Mulray. Uh, Jake wants that justice, protection. Maybe it's love too, but the, the actual goal is I want to help her get out of here. Now, there's a lot of things that they're working for him. He loves her, um, he's smart and resourceful, he's determined, and he's willing to help. Because there are a lot of things that are really kind of against him. There's a rich, powerful people, uh, a crooked system. He's haunted by, by Chinatown and his past. It's really this awful thing. And then, it's funny, McKee actually talks about Chinatown in terms of pride, like the Oedipus story. He's too proud, and that's his flaw, and that's how he ends up losing her at the end, because he could have asked for help. I actually disagree. I, I don't think there's anything in that world of that story. Everybody's crooked. Everybody knows he's crooked. I don't believe there's anything he could do to actually help her. So to me, it's more the issue of fate. So once again, this is science, but it's not science, because ultimately you're the person who's trying to figure this out. So, so the problem is he doesn't get that. It's a, it's, a, it's a tragedy, you know, he doesn't get it. Wants to help, love, whatever you want to call it, does not bring justice protection to her. It doesn't do that. What does get Evelyn ultimately? These things, they pull her down. So, you know, even though, um, even though a smart, capable guy who loves somebody and is willing to face the worst fears of his past tries to help somebody, sometimes blank, I think it's fate. Fate in, a, in an effed up world will cause everything to, you know, to die anyways. You, know, you can see how you can get this idea out of examining, well, what are the good things, what are the bad things? He didn't get it, he, didn't able to, he wasn't able to bring that to her, he wasn't able to get that. What caused that? The negative determinants did. So it wasn't this nice thing, it was the negative stuff. I don't know if you can see this arrow here, but all this stuff, the crooked system, the rich, powerful person, those are the things that ultimately uh, got Evelyn instead of being able to, Jake being able to bring this to her. So once again, Maybe my, 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 maybe my subjective analysis of these are wrong. I didn't get this out of a book. I didn't even ask anybody if it's right, and I, and I started actually questioning it myself as I've done this class twice now, but you see how these ideas work together, and you can be that specific at some point. Not at the beginning of your script. No, don't do it then, but at some point, you can go back and try to, try to uh, get deeper with this stuff. So, theme checklist. What can, what can you do for your story? Because, you know, there's some theory here. I want you to think about how all this stuff comes together, but, but there's stuff you can do. You can write right-brained, meaning you are not going to, like, be paralyzed by all this stuff and be thinking, oh, my God, how does every line of dialogue and, and every sentence contribute to this? No. You're going to vomit stuff out on the page. You're going to create pages. You're going to create outlines and structures. You're going to get all this stuff. And then later on, you apply these ideas. Or if in the back of your head, you're unconscious, you kind of know what it's about, and you're saying, well, where should I set this? You know, and, oh, a dark basement, or, ooh, the light should be out, or he should have, uh, you know, in Silence of the Lambs, he should have uh, hunting equipment because of sight. That's cool. Maybe it gives you an idea. But do not get bogged down. Do not get bogged down with the left brain aspect of this. It's, uh, it's stuff that you have to know, and if it can creep from your unconscious to your conscious, it'll help you eventually, but don't get bogged down by this. Um, set up a small version of the dilemma early on. Like, like, if you know your ending, if you know what your movie's about, like I gave that example in Serpico, and like Confidential, that means earlier on, you don't have generic scenes. You don't have scenes where they're talking or shooting the shit or just hanging out. You have scenes that can start revealing exactly the issue that the movie's about. Does that make sense? So set up a small version of the dilemma, foreshadow it early on. Now, once you've figured out what the dilemma is, after you've applied some analysis, you can tweak your subplots because Subplots are like probably the biggest, you know, or just one of the biggest elements that you're going to put together. I talked about, you know, Eisensteinian montage or, or, you know, dialectical juxtaposition. You put two things together, they create meaning. Well, subplots are huge. Subplots, you know, foil characters, reflection characters, they're going to rhyme and resonate and, and contradict or support uh, your ideas. So these are really important. So if you figure out what your idea is, maybe you need to go back and tweak it so that, hey, that subplot character is dealing with something, but really 
isn't the same thing. It doesn't necessarily belong to this movie, but suddenly you can tweak it a little bit, right, to bring it kind of on track. So like, or, you know, like the character of the priest in, uh, in uh, Million Dollar Baby. Maybe at one time he was a friend, but then you realize, wait a second, it's about guilt, and, and, and he's going to be obliterated by that guilt because he carries that weight in his past. So I need a character who can say about guilt to him, oh, that needs to be a priest. Oh, and speaking of a priest, a priest might be the person he goes. So it's like you can actually use this kind of, you know, the, the chicken egg, the back and forth to uh, tweak your subplot so that they're, they're on theme. Consider your opening scene. I kind of challenge my students in, the, in my screenwriting class to come up with an opening scene that just sums up your entire movie. That's just so right there. And uh, I give examples, and this is, actually isn't the opening scene, but some of the images in the, the beginning of Midnight Cowboy. Uh, one of the images is um, him dropping a soap in the shower. If you know what this movie's about, that's pretty right on. But there's, a, there's actually a better moment, too. There's a better moment. Uh, and I don't even know where this comes, but this should be the beginning of the movie. Um, a little kid dressed in a cowboy suit is on one of those rocking horses in, the, in a rundown movie theater, drive-in theater. And you pull back, and it's all run down. He's alone with nobody there. He's doing it by himself. And then he runs inside and jumps into bed with his mother and her, her, her weird lover. And the ideas of the masculinity, the macho, the male, the movie images, that, and the media images that completely have defined him and, and have trapped him and, and, and haunt him throughout the movie, like the radio ads you know, for Orange Juice in Florida. I mean, there's like 16 or 17 like, meaningful choices in that scene, and it's so powerful. So one of my students in my screenwriting class said, well, Jim, we have seven right here. Let's pop it in and see, you know, make, let's make sense of this masterpiece. So I, you know, I, I had seen seven once or twice, and I said, let's, let's, let's roll the dice. Uh, okay, we'll try. So maybe I remember this wrong, but a scene came up, and it was actually peculiar because it had a, it had a kind of a wide lens. It was kind of a short lens, which uh, emphasizes the distance between, uh, between things. Things look farther apart. Remember how I told you, like, the person coming towards a camera and the short lens will look like they're covering more ground? Because it's only covering 10 feet, but it looks like they cover 20 feet. So there's a sense of paying attention to, to and from. And uh, Morgan, it's Morgan Freeman's apartment. And in front, in the foreground, there are these colored little bottles in a row. And then in the background, there's a window that's open, and all the sounds and chaos of the city are coming through the window. And Morgan Freeman's in the middle, and I don't even know what he was doing. But I said, well, I don't think it's Brad Pitt's story. I think it's Morgan Freeman's story. I think at the end he says, you know, uh, life is good, it's worth fighting for. Well, I believe in the second part. You know, this is existentialism 101. Is life order and make sense? Or is it the chaos that's out there that you have no control over? I don't know. I, I don't have a philosophy degree. I don't, you know, I probably can't give you a working definition of existentialism, but it made sense to me. I, I found meaning in that. And I'm stretching a little bit, but hey, you know, it, it's not, it's not too far to the ballpark. And if, if you say, Jim, it means something else, or I can find some better meaning, good. Go to your script and say to yourself, do I have an opening scene that says, I know what this movie's about? And if you don't know yet, go to your ending, go to your dilemma, go to your climax, and say, okay, I'm going to mirror it here, and I'm going to even shadow it here, too. Another movie that really knows what it's about, whether it's a perfect movie or not, is Mission Impossible. It opens up, and, and, and uh, Tom Cruise is in a mask, pretending to have killed this woman, in a jail cell to make this guy really scared and give up the information. And uh, psych, they tricked him. He's not really that guy. They didn't really kill her. But then there's a bigger psych. Psych, this is all soundstage. You, we thought we were in a prison. So the level of deception is like four, five, six, seven layers deep. This is a movie about deception, and the, the filmmakers know that. So go back to your opening scene and think about what you can bring to, what you can bring to it. <laughs> Layer in setups, the alley-oop and image systems. This is the last thing you do. You don't worry about this all the way, but you know, if your ending is a pure action and just an action, go back and see if there's a little line of dialogue that can put it in context. Like, you know, if you're in a romantic comedy and a character says, you know, I was, someone else asked me this question, if you would ever just shut up and listen, I would love you. Nah, that's on the nose, that's fine, this is my first draft. And at the end of the movie, if, if this talky character suddenly just shut up and listened, and then she, she kisses them there together, we'd say, oh, he, he listened, he, that's what, what he wanted, but we didn't get that, it wouldn't necessarily be all from that scene, it would be those words would allow us to understand that, and that's a clunky example, but just think about the way you can use words to set up the actions. Just think about uh, layering in this stuff uh, near final draft. Hone dialogue, once again I was saying before, absolutely do not put dialogue in there just because it's thematic, just because it, uh, you know, it makes your point, but 
when it's working on all other levels, if you want to go back and tweak your dialogue with whatever, flavor, keywords, image systems, you know, think of Chinatown, the water and, and dryness and, and all that stuff. Think about little things that can repeat. You can go back and do that. God forbid that you would say, oh, well, this line's thematic, that's why it's there. Don't do that. But you can definitely tweak your dialogue. Finally, rethink your title. Because when you're all done, if you really, really know what your movie's about, why not make it also so coherent that you even know what it's about? Midnight Cowboy. You know, I, I just, I mean, I could sit here and talk about the title probably for, for half an hour, but, you know, at nighttime, shadow, darkness, uh, a cowboy, this masculine guy, he's alone, but it's midnight and he's alone. I mean, there's just so much power there. I think it's like one of the most thematically coherent movies. It's one of my favorite like American movies. Maybe it's just a favorite movie. It's just a really good movie. So think about your title. Think about, you know, now that I really know what my, my movie's about, can I actually kind of sum it up uh, a little bit better? So that's, that's concrete stuff you can do. Now you know. You have a dilemma, a strong dilemma, and the character resolves it in a certain way. And that has meaning. You have subplots that are going to support that or contradict it or help it be clear exactly what you're trying to mean. You have character orchestration, which, you know, in chicken egg, does, does the dilemma and structure and the subplots come out of character or structure or, you know, which one comes first? But you have your characters, and they're going to embody these ideas. They're going to come into conflict with the main character. And, and it's like, you know, it's like Spock, Bones, and Kirk. You know, one's all emotion, one's no emotion, and Kirk's a human, and, and that's, it's great for conflict because he's whole and, and you see how they come into conflict. So think about the way the characters work together. Dialogue, not just for the sake of being thematic, just like you wouldn't you write horrible dialogue that's the subtext on the nose with, for drama, you, won't, you don't write it on the nose thematically. But you can layer in stuff, taglines, a uh, little bit of theme line up front. You can, you can taint or paint or you know, just, just slightly coax your dialogue a little bit towards your ideas, but definitely don't bog it down with all this thematic intent. The last thing you can do is uh, image systems. You can go in and you can layer in little ideas, little motifs, little recurring things. Don't ever bog a script down. It should pretty much be an unconscious thing for the reader. And ultimately, the director is often the person who puts that in. But you can be thinking about all the tools that you have in front of you. Like I started talking about like, you know, lenses and stuff because I think as a filmmaker, as a director, I think in terms of not just the screenplay, but you have to understand every single tool that's available to you, and ask yourself, how can I make a choice you know, with my words, with my dialogue, with my character, with the conflict, with the subplots? How can I make a choice that contributes to this idea that I'm trying to do? But don't let all this stuff bog you down. I mean, the idea is now you know how it works. Samuel Goldwyn said, if you want to send a message, use Western Union. Well, guess what? That's not your only option. Now you know how these tools work. And the reason why sometimes I'm wrestling with left brain ideas is because if you can nail your idea, if you can nail what your movie's about down with like a lot of concision, with specificity, it gives you a lot of power. So like have subplots intersect and clarify, have a little subtle line of dialogue, you know, nail something so you know what your movie's about. I know you want to express ideas. I know you have a viewpoint in the world that you want to express it. So I'm giving you the tools. Now, the accuracy, the validity, or how universal the ideas that you're communicating are, that's up to you. But if you trust yourself, take these tools, Pour it in there, and if you believe in it, take it all the way.